I love the comfort that we can find in the words of scripture and in the songs we sing, and it just reminds you that God is in control and um, that it is well with us. And we're going to sing it as well with my soul as we take our offering. And at this time, if you'd like to be seated for a little while, go ahead and sit down. But if you want to keep standing, that's okay too, because we're spread out enough that you should be able to see the uh, overhead. So. <laughs>
present. Oh, Father in heaven, we praise you, Lord, that through all the craziness and all the media hype and all the uh, warnings out there that are legitimate. They're legitimate because this is something that is deadly. Lord, through all this, we have your strength, we have your courage, we have your guidance, we have your love. And Lord, we just thank you for that and praise you for your calm, the calm you give us through all this, Lord. Help us to see you, Lord, in this and to help people bridge to you, Lord. In your prayer. Amen. I haven't talked in front of a small group like this in a long time. So this is different for you, this is different for me. So let's make the best of it that we can today. We are, and I thought the music was really good, so thank you very much, Praise Team. I appreciate that. So we're going to stay in the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter number 21. You say, well, what more are we going to find in 2 Chronicles, chapter number 21, that applies to us in this time of need? I cannot help but think, as I look at the chapter, as you look at 2 Chronicles, chapter number 21, it's just beginning to get bad and difficult. Jehoshaphat's passed away. His son Jehoram comes to the throne, and now we're going to see that he passes off the scene, and his son comes to the throne after that. And so there is approximately a 15-year period, and we're just now getting to almost the midpoint where things are chaotic and things are unlike anything they had ever been before. And there's that common question that people would ask when, we, when they go through chaos, which is, where is God in all the chaos and all the disorder that we're going through? And ironically, we're, we're really in a, a period, I don't want to say our period compares to others in times past, but for this generation, this is chaos. For this generation, they've never seen anything like this before. And so the same thought goes into play, which is, where is God in all my chaos? And so we come to a real fundamental principle, and that is, in the midst of the chaos that we experience in life, is God present? Is God there? Do we see the story of God in our chaos, or do we simply see it at the beginnings and the ends? The times that we start, or the time that we end? Can we find God in the in-between times? And I think that's something that should be really important to you and I. I can't help but think there's a level of ignorance, there's a level of rejection. The two terms itself imply this. Ignorance means it's not necessarily something that you knew about and were aware of. So I think about ignorance and rejection from the standpoint of, I thought I had this on a different slide, but it's, it's not there. But I'm going to talk about ignorance in respect of washing your hands. You know how important it is to wash your hands at this point in time, correct? You know how important it is to have social distancing. That's why you're sitting in every other seat. Um, the idea of washing your hands is you keep germs off your hands. You say, well, I don't like to wash my hands with soap. Well, there's times when we do lots of things that we maybe don't like to do, but it's important to do. So ignorance is you didn't know how to wash your hands. What's the rule of thumb when it comes to washing hands? What's the song that you use? Happy birthday. So the irony is... I know, but when you think about happy birthday, suddenly the song itself bears a different level of meaning than it ever bared before, right? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, and you keep doing it maybe two times. Maybe for Rhonda, she does it 15 times, but you get the idea. So there's that ignorance. I did not know I had to go that long. But now the rejection comes into play where you know that you're supposed to wash your hands. Maybe you don't like to wash your hands with soap. You just want to put them underneath water because you don't like the way soap feels on your body. The rejection comes into play when you say, I know what the consequence is, but I'm really not interested in doing that because I'm used to doing it this way. There comes that point in time in our life where ignorance no longer is an excuse and has become outright rejection of what the norms are or what the principles are. And I believe that's what we see taking place here in our text as we're looking at it today. So when we talk about the omnipresence of God, God is present during the good and the bad. God is present when the economy is doing great. God is also present when the economy is doing bad. God is present when everyone's healthy. 
God is present when everybody's sick. God is present in the good and the bad. So when you look at Scripture, you come to this point in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 16, where Jeremiah simply said this. He said, ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? But they said, we don't want the old paths. We don't want to walk in them. We have found a better way. And Jehoram, as a king, has come to that place in his life where he has said that very same thing. Despite the fact that I saw God present in my father's life, despite the fact that I saw God present in the lives of many others, I think I have found a better way. And I want you to notice how it begins in 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verse number 12 and 13. Here's what it says. Jehoram received a letter from Elijah the prophet. Whose team is Elijah on? God's team. God still cares, doesn't he? You say, well, I would have expected God to show up and talk to me person to person. God shows up in many different ways, doesn't he? But God is still there, isn't he? God may show up by a dream. God may show up by a vision. God may show up through his Holy Spirit speaking with me. But God also shows up by a letter in this case. What letter is it do I have that I have the advantage of referring to? The word of God itself. And so Jehoram receives this letter from Elijah the prophet. What does it say? This is what, not Elijah says, not the CDC, not the president, not the government, not the state in this guys, but the Lord God of your father David. You may not have chosen to follow the God of David. You may be choosing your own God, but I want you to hear what I, the Lord, say. You have not followed the ways of your father. You've not chosen the old path. You wanted to brave a new trail. You wanted to cut a new trail. That's a great picture there. So let's go back to where it was if we can. We will. It's got to reload. Okay. So when you think about the text of Scripture, I'm glad that's why I've got it in my Bible. So it goes on to say this. And so Elijah's read this, and the letter says, Because I not walk in the way of Jehoshaphat, thy father, nor in the ways of Asa, king of Judah, but here's the way that you've walked. And you've walked in the ways of the king of Israel, and you've made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to go a whoring like the whoredoms of the house of Ahab, and also slain thy brethren of thy father's house for better. Of all the things that Jehoram thought he was doing and getting away with, who saw it? God. God saw it. Remember David, when David took Bathsheba to be his wife? Who showed up at David's house? Nathan. Nathan showed up at David's house and said, David, you're the man who's guilty. Whatever it is that we are going through in our culture, in our homes, in our place of work, God is aware of all the details that transpire in our lives. Can I trust God to na help me navigate through the difficult situation in my life? But how many times do I allow the pressures of the world to creep into my mind mindset and affect the way that I think, affect the way that I act? And so as you look at this text, you see God is present in even the most difficult of times. And so as you move forward in Scripture, you come to another point. That is, God observes all the details. Everything, even those little things that we thought we had hidden that no one else knew about. God knows those details. God knows the details of your life. One man's legacy may become a legend, just like Jehoshaphat. Was Jehoshaphat a good king? He was a great king. As I read about all the kings of Judah, David was a good king. Solomon was a good king. But I cannot help but come to the conclusion that as I know more and more about Jehoshaphat, he was a man, as Scripture said, that he prepared his heart to <gasps> seek the Lord. And it really motivates me in my life. How hard do I prepare my heart to seek God? And so Jehoshaphat is what I would call a legend within the life of Judah as a nation. He was really focusing, how can I prepare my heart to seek God, to find God, to display him before the nation of whom I lead? And yet, Jehoram's life becomes a tragedy. In Psalm chapter 112, verse number 6, and Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 7, it relates to simple truths that a man who seeks the principles of God's word, he will always be remembered. But the man who blazes his own trail and seeks after sin, he's going to be forgotten so quickly, and that's exactly what happens in Jehoram's case. And that's what goes on and says this in Scripture, St. Chronicles chapter 21, verse number 14, 15. And as God has seen everything that Jehoram's done, 
Notice what the Lord says. So now the Lord is about to strike your people. He's going to strike your sons, your wives, and everything that's yours, everything that you thought was important, I'm going to strike it with a heavy blow. That's harsh, isn't it? But remember, what's the path that Jehoram chose? His own path. He didn't choose to honor God. He didn't choose to obey God. He didn't choose to follow the principles of the Word of God. He chose to go in his own direction. As a result, God is going to pronounce judgment on that. God is aware of all the details that have been hidden, as well as those who are on full display. Comes verse number 15 and says this, You yourself, Jehoram, you're going to become very ill with a lingering disease of the bowels. That does not sound very good, does it? Not at all. Of all the things I would not want to have problems with, hemorrhoids or anything along those lines is not it. I can tell that Rhonda finds this very humorous, which is quite all right. But I can't help but think and laugh at Jehoram. Be sure your sin will find you out. And you say, I did not want my sin to be exposed in such a very public way. And yet that's what happens, doesn't it? And God says that even the hidden details of the hearts, God knows that. And what does the Lord say? Remember, this is God talking here through Elijah. And the Lord says this, until the disease causes your bowels to come out. Whether it be King James, NIV, ESV, I don't care what translation you use, the story is still the same. It is not good. It is not good at all. There's another principle that we discover, and that is the Lord cares for me during the most difficult, during the most darkest times of my life. As you read the story that we find related from 2 Chronicles chapter number 21, it ends during a dark time, doesn't it? And yet God knows that what he's doing is not just during an eight-year period, but it's going to go through a 15-year period, a long period. And in the end, God is going to manifest himself once again. No one in this room knows what's going to happen in the next 24 hours, next 72 hours, next week, let alone the next several weeks to we? But we do know that God is in control of all the events that take place in our lives, in our nation, the world in which we live. He cares in the most darkest and difficult times that we go through. His actions are never accidental, but God's actions are always intentional. In the book of Genesis chapter 50, verse number 20, we find the story, as you recall, about Joseph. We remember all the hardship that Joseph went through, being thrown in the pit, being left for dead, being sent off to Egypt as a slave, going through all the hardship that he went through. But there came that point in time when Joseph realized that God meant it unto good. As we go through the difficult period of life now as a nation, and as people, wherever it is that we are, does God mean it for good? Can God use something like this as an opportunity for us to be a blessing to others? Can God use it for good? But oftentimes, what do we focus on? Just like people rushing into Costco, just like people rushing into a grocery store, they're focused on what? What they have to have at that very moment. Can God use us for good in someone else's life? James chapter 1, verse number 12, James simply writes this, not just that one phrase in reference there, but the concept that James relates is, blessed is the man that endures temptation. Blessed is the man that stands strong during the most difficult of times. So what do I stand strong in? My personal reserves of wealth? My personal reserves of strength? I stand strong and the strength that God provides. I go to the book of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 10, and I look at what Peter writes here. He says, but God will make you. God's doing something in my life, isn't he? God is making me perfect. He's establishing me. He's settling me. These are things, not that I do of my own, but these are things that God does within me. How does he do that? As I focus, as I make his word priority in my life. You come to the last portion of the text, it doesn't really get any better. But what we do see is that God is present. God is present through the difficult times. Here's what it says. 
So the Lord aroused against Jehoram the hostility of the Philistines and of the Arabs who lived near the Cushites. Now notice this, top of verse number 16, who's doing this? God's working, isn't it? And what do we sit back and say? Well, I don't like the way that God's working. I don't like it. If that were me, I wouldn't do it that way. But that's where we have the problem, isn't it? We are not God. God is working with a end game plan in mind. So the Lord's doing this. Verse number 17, they attacked Judah. It's not going very well, is it? Carried off all the goods, found the king's palace, gathered his sons, his wives. Not a son was left him except one. It's fulfilling God's word too, isn't it? Not only do I see what God promises, not only do I see that God said, I'm causing this, but God keeps every principle of his word. God fulfills it. Have you and I not seen God fulfill his word in our lives? Verse number 18, after all this, once again, who's involved? The Lord, the Lord shows up. God is fulfilling his word. He said, well, that's not very good news for the king, particularly when we know what's gonna happen to him. But yet God's there. God is there as I go through the most difficult times in my life. It brings me back to that foundational point, which is it really serves me in good stead to know what God's word says so I can follow that road. Like Jeremiah said, I get to a place in my life when the world's going in chaos, I really want to ground myself on the old paths, don't I? But it becomes easy to do what everyone else does simply because the crowd mentality has bred me that way. Verse number 19, in the course of time after the end of the second year, his bowels came out by because of the great disease and he died in great pain. You say, well, where is God in this? If you forgot, God was in there in verse number 18. God was there in verse number 16. God is not left. For whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. Come to verse number 20. So Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He passed away to no one's regret. Why? Because he insisted on going down the path that was separate from the path that God would have him go down. He wanted to live a life that was fast, full, and furious, satisfying what he wanted rather than pursuing a life pattern that God's word established for him. Do we see what the outcome is? Yeah, we do. But we also see that God's right there. God gave him warning, didn't he? We come to this conclusion, it says this, he passed away to no one's regret, was buried in the city of David, but not the tombs of the kings. We may not like the chapter that we read, we may not like a chapter of life that we're currently living or that we're experiencing. But the reality is this, we oftentimes fail to see the final outcome. Where we're at in chapter number 21 of 2 Chronicles does not sort itself out for at least three or four chapters later when we find Joash the young king come to the throne. Guess who shows up again? God exalts himself among his people. There's a number of people who are hiding in the shadows who want to do that which is right, but they're being suppressed by that. And I cannot help but think, God is glorified in all the things that are done around us. Do we bring glory to God even through the difficult times? Do we sense God's presence there? Or are we walking around with blinders on, unobserved, unaware of what God's doing? It's God who's working together all things for his good, Romans chapter 8, 28. What's the emphasis there as we look at scripture? Is it, is it for my good? It's not always for my good, is it? But it's for his good. Because God's purpose is far greater than everything I can possibly imagine. Which should cause me to focus that the difficulty that I may go through may not necessarily be my good at that present time. But God is working his good in a way that I cannot see right now. So what should I begin doing? Begin praying through the Holy Spirit. Lord, give me eyes to see. You promise that you will bless. You promise that you will protect. You promise that you will guide me. Guide me through a time that is difficult beyond my understanding. Is this a promise that you and I can rely on? I certainly think it is. Let's bow in prayer.
Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the promise of your word that you show up even during the most difficult times of life. We see that in the story as it's related to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter number 21, that even though Jehoram made the wrong choices, you were there trying to warn him, trying to encourage him. You were there even disciplining him, but yet he turned away from you intentionally. He rejected you. God, I pray that we would seek your face as we face difficulty, as we face decision, so that we might not find ourselves in a position of dilemma, but Lord, that we would experience the blessing that only you can provide. First, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen.
But if you know of people who need help, there's a link that we have on our Facebook page that you can use that. You say, well, if I don't use Facebook, what can I do? Well, you can still contact the office and we can still help you with that. But just be aware that we have those methods that are out there. We're going to close with a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Thanks for your time here today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. But we thank you for the fact that you know where we are at all times. We are not hidden from you. We ask, Lord, for your safety. We ask for your protection. We ask for you to watch for our health. Be with us for those that are here. We think of those that are not able to be here. We ask, Lord, that you protect them as well. Lord, help us to be a witness for you during this time. And help us to look for your presence around us, even in the difficult 